Uh, I'm Will Coleman. My name's Liz Halliday. My name's Megan Kefferly. Everybody, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we're excited to host our first webinar uh, live with the Horse Network. Um, I'm Amanda Drobnes, co-founder and CEO of Hilltop Bio. We are a regenerative therapy company. Have, we have products for both equine and canine, and we're focused on cutting edge regenerative therapies that make it easy for our veterinarians and for our horse owners to use our products. We make a handful of products, and this webinar covers Regeniflex RT for soft tissue injuries. We also have a, a summer sore gel, which is available for horse owners, um, and they can purchase that on our website. Today with us is uh, Dr. Bill Whitaker. He has a degree in animal science from Oklahoma State. Um, he got his veterinary degree from Texas A&M. Go Texans, you're awesome. Um, <laughs> he's been with Brazos Valley since 2007. Um, received his uh, Certified Equine Rehab Practitioner Certification in 2014 from the University of Tennessee. And when he's not busy doing all sorts of medicine and all sorts of fun things with horses, um, he enjoys spending time with his family outdoors, drawing. He's an amazing, accomplished artist um, and sculpting. And so since 2019, he's been a veterinary advisor to Hilltop Bio, and we're really excited to have him uh, present to you about uh, new things in suspensory injuries. So thanks, Dr. Whitaker. Thank you, Amanda, for the intro. All right, let's get started. We're going to talk about the dreaded S word in the equine veterinary industry, the suspensory ligament. Um, I call it the S word just because I've made quite a few girls and I'm, I think a few men cry um, as well using this word. Uh, the suspensory ligament. And so we're going to talk today kind of about what that ligament is, some of the um, types of injuries we see with it, why we see those injuries um, as well, and then um, kind of go through some of the, the new things that are coming out as far as regenerative therapies, including the Hilltop Bio product that Amanda mentioned. Uh, just as a disclaimer, I am an advisor for Hilltop Biosciences. And again, I'm a veterinarian at Brazos Valley Equine Hospital, and we're in Salado, Texas, which is just north of north of Austin. All right, let's go over a little bit of anatomy, um, just to, so you're all familiar with what we're talking about, because there are different parts of this ligament that sometimes can heal differently, and sometimes we'll use different treatments in those different areas. So this can be a very, um, uh, you know, a very important part of the anatomy, just understanding it. So the proximal suspensory or the origin, so the, the area where it starts, is typically there right at the back of the cannon bone in the back of the small carpal bones, or in the hind leg, we're looking at the back of the cannon bone and the back of the small tarsal bones. So once, once you get the ligament past that insertion, we call the next part the body. So that's kind of the mid part of that ligament before it branches. We get about two thirds down the leg and the ligament will branch into two branches about the size of a, a finger in, in diameter. Um, they both attach on the top and the side and the outside of the sesamoid bones. As part of the suspensory apparatus, we also have the sesamoid ligaments. So those ligaments, there's three main ones uh, or groupings of, of ligaments that are below, below the sesamoid bones. They attach the sesamoid bones and then attach at different points on the pasture. And they all function to help, help stabilize the, the fetlock. I think comparative anatomy is really interesting. And by that, I just mean, you know, most things as far as structures in our bodies have been cons conserved through evolution between people and horses and dogs and, you know, all the different types of animals. So I think it's kind of neat to look at those similar structures in different, different animals. And it's nice to look where we can compare things to what we have. So in people, the suspensory ligament is the interosseous muscle. You can see the picture there on, on the back side of the finger. Um, so that ligament would be sitting, say it'd be coming from your wrist on those long bones in your hand. It would be on the, on the bottom side of those long bones in your hand. Obviously our digits function much differently. So we need to be able to prehend things. Like we need to be able to grab something and hold it. So that developed as a muscle to help 
help in that motion. They also help stabilize the digits. Now in a horse, obviously they're not grabbing things. They needed something that could hold up a thousand pounds that's running across a, a prairie. So in, in the horses, their structure is developed to be this dense, thick ligament. Now it does have some muscle in it. So at the, the top third of that ligament, there are muscles. There's kind of an inner twining of muscle and, and ligament tissue there. Um, that, so there still is some muscle conserved in the horse, but most of it's just turning this dense, thick ligament that functions very differently than the inner, inner osseous muscle that, that, people, that people have, that we have in our hands and also in our feet, like in the, on the bottom part of our feet as well. So let's go into a little bit of the function of the suspensory ligament. So I mentioned a little bit before, but what it does is it helps support the fetlock joint. So that fetlock joint wants to drop to the ground. So we have the suspensory ligament, the branches, those sesamoid ligaments that I discussed. We also have the superficial flexor tendon that wraps around the back of that ankle. Um, all those structures help to hold that fetlock up against those huge loads of pressure that are bearing down, you know, going through that horse's leg down to their feet. What it does is it prevents hyperextension of the limb. Now, if you look at that picture, you can see the, the off leg. So the leg cuts most, you know, most far away from us there. You've got, oh no, around a 45 degree angle maybe for that fetlock joint. If you take the angle that goes down the cannon bone and then draw a line to the, to the toe. And the leg we're looking at that's closest to us, there's a 90 degree angle there. You can see that it just comes straight down and 90 degrees over. So this horse has breakdown of the suspensory apparatus. Um, and then, and because of that, that fetlock is starting to descend or drop closer and closer to the ground because the structural integrity can no longer hold that, that fetlock up. So why do these get injured? Well, I think there can be several different region, reasons. One is genetic collagen disorders. Now, there's, I think there's lots of, probably lots of different ones of these that we don't get recognized. DSLD is the one that most commonly gets, gets used. And I think sometimes for lack of a better, a better term, and there's some new terms out there for this condition and some new ways we think maybe it, it works, which I won't go into. But I think sometimes um, what, we, what we have with these is these horses get selected that are really elastic because they move beautifully. So we think about our dressage horses with all that motion. We'll see our pacifinos that really have this exaggerated, exaggerated limb motion. And because of that, I think those horses get selected because they, they move the way we want them to move. But, you know, nothing comes without a cost. And when you have increased elasticity and increased flexibility, you all ha also have decreased stability. And so these horses, I think, sometimes are more prone to getting injured just because they, they're more elastic moving and there's less stability around these joints. But then the, we, we think there's probably also some of these horses that genetically have some collagen disorders where the collagen does not does not move correctly or the or the collagen does not heal correctly um, and allow these horses to, to heal in a normal way. And so they take longer to heal or these little micro injuries that I think some horses get that they're able just to recover and not be lame. You now these horses, they tend to build up over time. We also have progressive overload injuries. So can we go back to the last to the last slide? We also can get progressive overload. So Typically in these cases, most commonly, I think we're dealing with a secondary injury or compensatory injury, as we sometimes call them. Say you have a, a knee and a front leg that with arthritis, um, that horse is bearing more load on the left front. And over time, that suspensory, because it's having to take more load, starts to develop inflammation um, and then starts to develop some degeneration over time just because of progressive overload. In high limbs, we see a lot of these proximal suspensory with, with horses that have issues higher up. So sometimes you may have, a, oftentimes we see horse with SI issues. And I think because they have decreased hip flexion and hip motion, those suspensory ligaments just are taking more load and so they get inflamed. So sometimes we even may treat, say an SI, and the suspensory pain goes away without even addressing the, the suspensory ligament. Then we have acute overload injuries. So these are just your typical horse is fine, the ligament's fine, uh, the horse runs across the pasture, steps in a hole or goes over a fence and, you know, then you get a, a big tear or a hole in the ligament. And those are just more acute injuries that don't, aren't necessarily because the horse has a genetic problem. 
All right, now we're talking about suspensory injury prevalence or just looking at how often do these injuries occur. There's actually two really large studies. There's one that Sue Dyson performed, who's a, a great veterinarian in Great Britain. Um, and she, this was a retro, retrospective study, meaning they just looked back to past cases and compiled them. And they found that suspensory injuries were the most common injury for general purpose horses, for elite show jumping horses, for elite dressage horses, and also for non-elite dressage horses. In her study, 28% of the injuries to the elite dressage horses and 29.5% in the elite non-dressage horses were due to the suspensory ligament. High limb suspensories were more common than front limbs and just in the general population. And dressage horses were at a higher risk. The University of Zurich performed a retrospective study over a 17-year period. It's a really long study. They looked at over 1,500 horses in that study, which is quite a few horses. They found that suspensors accounted for 31% of injuries, and the frequency of those injuries um, was 41% dressage horses, 28.6% in show jumpers, and 28% in pleasure horses. Basically, the gist of this is, looking at these two studies, about 30% or so of our total injuries are due to the suspensory ligament, which is really high, given that it's just one structure in the body. Now, Sue Dyson, who did the, pre the study that we looked at on the previous page, also did one on suspensory branches. In this one, she looked at um, four limb injuries compared to high limb injuries. And it's pretty intuitive. 76% of our inventors had four limb injuries. Obviously, they're going over jumps, landing, putting all that weight down those fetlocks. Um, the suspensory ligaments trying to keep that fetlock from dropping to the ground. Those over time, those are more likely to get injured. And then in dressage horses, the hind limbs accounted for 87%. Again, that's very intuitive, the way the dressage horses have to load their back ends. Periligamentous fibrosis, which I know is a, a long term if you're not used to using medical jargon. Basically, the branches on is very common to get scar tissue around it. So you get this kind of large thickening around these branches. Sometimes it makes those fetlocks look really big and fat. Um, it, it, what she found was that horses that had that um, were more likely not to recover as well. Um, and 78% of those horses, um, they, they had fibrosis in the hind limb and 35% in the forelimb. So basically just, it was more common in the hind limbs in the front and horses that had it were less likely to have favorable outcomes. And the horses in that study that she looked at, 43% returned to full athletic function at the previous level for at least one year. So horses with suspensory branch injuries, 43% returned to full work at one year, so less than 50%. If we look at some of the healing rates in proximal suspensories, so generally proximal suspensories, more commonly in hind legs, in most of our disciplines, although we do see, you know, quite a few front limb proximal suspensory injuries as well. Uh, one study that was presented at our annual veterinary convention in 2001, they looked at 100 horses that were treated with BMAC. So BMAC stands for bone marrow aspirate concentrate. So you're taking bone marrow from the horse's sternum generally, and concentrating it, then injecting it back in the horse. And th that study, the, the, the proximal suspensories, they had 84% that were sound at six months, which is really great great number. Of those horses, 15 had a fasciotomy, which is where you go and split this, split this dense connective tissue that's in the back of the suspensory that releases pressure and decreases pain in that area and, and helps with the healing process. So those horses, they weren't all just getting that. The bone marrow, a lot of them were also getting this procedure as well. Another study looked at 52 horses. These horses were treated with electrohydraulic shockwave therapy. Um, which is a little bit different from the other types of shockwave. Of those horses, 40% were back in work at six months and 18% at one year. So not great long-term results with that at one year. The Sue Dyson had another study where she looked at 42 horses. And only 14% of those were, were sound at one year um, or didn't have recurrence you know, after, after the injury. So one thing in that study that had such great numbers is we didn't really get the numbers more long term. So those horses were better at six months. You know, as, as the study we kept next to it, 40% of those were better at six months, but at one year, only 18%. So I, I would I would surmise that likely those numbers would go down, you know, over once you get to that year point and beyond. You know, I suspect that 84% is not going to hold up past that period. 
Uh, this study looked at Western performance horses. So it's a group that goes to a lot of Western performance horse shows. They were looking at PRP and shockwave, uh, not together, but separately. So they treated one group of horses with PRP. They treated the second group of horses with shockwave only. Um, basically, they found that uh, at six months, about 60% with PRP were back in work and about 67% at one year. With shockwave therapy, 68% were back in work at six months and 76% at one year. What they did find was the horses that got PRP had better long-term outcomes if, if they had more severe lesions than the horses that got shockwave therapy. The mild, the mild lesions, the grade one lesions on ultrasound, they seem to respond better to the, to the shockwave therapy long-term. So that was the interesting finding of that study was the PRP seemed to be more effective um, from the more severe lesions long-term. Now, most of the time we're using combined therapies. So we're gonna talk about the study that we did where we combine two products. And that's most commonly what is done in practice, which is the reason we decided to do that in, in the study that we performed. Now, it can be confusing. And I think sometimes just, I think owners, there's so many things out there, they hear about so many different products, and don't always know what they are. So I thought we'd just go over kind of some broad general categories of, of products. I'm not gonna list everything that's out there, um, but I, would, I was gonna just at least list the main ones so everybody knows about stem cells and we can talk a little bit here in a minute about some of the ways that we think stem cells are, are effective. Now there's two big categories. So there's autologous, which for any product, we, we have mainly these categories, the autologous products, which come from the same animal. So if you're going to treat an injury on that animal, the product you're using, you derive from that animal's body. So typically with stem cells, we're talking about your fat derived stem cells or bone marrow derived stem cells. You can also have allergenic stem cells. So that means they come from a donor. Um, with those, we have fat derived, we have bone derived. There's also some blood derived allergenic stem cells as well. Um, there's a product in Europe that's used quite often that's derived from, from blood. Then we have this other category that's a, probably one of the more common categories of products that are used these days for injuries and for joints. These are the autologous non-stem cell categories. So things that come from from the same animal that we're treating. So we have platelet-rich plasma, which is just a product where we take blood, concentrate the platelets, and then inject those platelets back in the horse. We have bone marrow or bone marrow aspirate concentrate, which we already mentioned. We have IRAP, which stands for interleukin receptor antagonist protein. So basically that's another blood drive product that <clears throat> it uses a serum that is centrifuged um, and then goes through a, a process of filtration and then you get syringes that you inject back into the horse. And then there's also a product called alpha-2 macroglobulin that's, again, drawn from the horse. There's a processing filtration system that helps concentrate these molecules that um, bind up inflammatory molecules in the horse. And then those get direct injected back into the horse, most oftentimes in joints, but also used in, in injuries as well. And then we have this broader category of, of allergenic products that birth derived tissues are, are the main one in that category. Now I'll say birth derived, most people probably are familiar with amnion or amniotic fluid. So most of these products contain amniotic fluid or a lot of them do. They also can contain other parts that come from the, the fetus or around the fetus as well, including some of the membranes and tissues that surround the amniotic fluid. There is a, a PRP product coming out that's allergenic. I don't know a whole lot about that product, but it sounds interesting. if if they can make that product as well. Um, but those are the main categories there that we talked about. We talked about our regenerative therapies. So Regeneflex is the product that we used in our study today. I'll show you some cases um, that this product was used in. I started using amniotic products a long time ago. Like I was originally using ones that were made from humans. So before we were really, we had the, all our, these different options on the equine um, derived products. There were human amnion products that I started using in suspensories and was seeing better results than I'd seen anything else. And so that got me kind of on the amnion birth derived tissue bandwagon. Um, and since then, you know, I've, I've used, used Regenaflex for you really happy with that product. So what's in it? Well, it's exosomes, which we're going to talk about what an exosome is. Um, that's kind of a new, new buzzword. There's growth factors. Um, so which are basically just different types of proteins um, that help 
kill things and do all kinds of things in the body. And then there's cytokines, which are another kind of protein that basically signal cells to do different things. Uh, Regeniflex's product, or most of their products are derived from a combination of amnion, um, so the amniotic fluid, um, and you have the amnion, which is the lining around that. You have the allen to waste, and you have the spongy layer, which again are some of the soft tissue layers surrounding that, that amnion and amniotic fluid. Some of these other numbers here are, aren't really made for this talk, but just to demonstrate what Regeniflex is putting into their product, <clears throat> helping to actually quantify what's in it and, and make sure the quality of it's good as well. This is a spot capture picture over here on the left where they labeled, radio labeled um, the exosomes. And so you can then look at the exosomes in the product and count them, um, which is pretty cool. You know, they look at that and, you know, on the quantification part, found that there were three and a half billion particles um, that matched the exosome size, just to make sure that, <clears throat> you know, the product is rich in exosomes, which, which it is. So what is an exosome? It's a word that I, I don't think I had heard until probably a few years ago, <clears throat> and I still really didn't know what it meant. So what it is, is this type of extracellular vesicle. So that just means a vesicle that's outside the cell. What happens is a bunch of vesicles form inside the cell. So the vesicle is just this little capsule with a bunch of proteins in it. <clears throat> it goes in and fuses the cell membrane and it releases all those little vesicles outside of the cell. Now inside those vesicles are contained with proteins, peptides, lipids, nucleic acids. So there's over six plus different types of RNA. So which is, as you probably know, are little genetic messengers in the body. Um, and then there's other metabolites as well. And so those cells are released out of the body with a target cell in mind. So it's being sent directly to a cell to perform a specific function. So what is that, exactly what does it do? Well, I kind of came up with this analogy. It's kind of like they're the carrier pigeon and the messenger in one. So they're being sent out to go tell a cell to do something. Um, and, they're the, and they have the package inside there, gets released into that cell. You can see in the picture there, those exosomes are getting released from one cell. You can see the little Pac-Man on the left is getting into the other cell with the Pac-Man on the right that's taking those exosomes in. And then that genetic material within that cell tells that cell what to do. So it's a delivery system that's like a repair, a repair toolbox. And so if a cell needs to do something to help heal an area, these exosomes go in there to help tell it what to do. The tissue reg regeneration is a very complex process. Um, I certainly don't understand all of it, um, but it's highly coordinated. And there's so many proteins and cells and genes involved that it, it can be mind boggling sometimes. Um, but exosomes, um, are well known to play the leading role in this process. So when we get this exosome thing refined, now exosomes aren't necessarily good. They can be bad too. You know, like cancers can spread through a, the aid of exosomes. So just because it's an exosome doesn't mean it's good, but specific exosomes at specific times can help, help us maximize our healing process. So just so you know, what we don't know about exosomes is the iceberg below the water and what we do know is above. So this is a, a new field. Um, we're still learning about it. It just recently have figured out that this is the main way that stem cells actually work. And at one time, you know, pluripotent stem cells was the term where we thought a stem cell, you put it somewhere and it just turns into whatever you put it into. Well, we know that's not the case because stem cells are, are dead pretty quickly after you put them in there. And so these exosomes are way we think the main way that stem cells are actually doing what they're doing in the body. And so also is a big factor in the way we think the Regenoflex product works as well. All right, so we're gonna look at some suspensory cases here, um, some products over the years that I've used with Regenoflex that were just really, um, really good cases that really demonstrated the power of, of these products. Now, I'm not gonna claim that every horse responds this well, but these were three of the cases where I was like, wow, and I can't believe that's almost too good to be true. So this is a dressage horse, actually an Arabian dressage horse, and a really large hole in the suspensory ligament. You can see there on the left, 
if you kind of look down the bottom part of that image to the left of it, there's a big black hole. If you look to the right, that was an image taken two and a half minutes later. So what I did on this horse was I injected Regenoflex using a ultrasound guidance. So I got it a needle into that hole and then filled that hole up with the product. And then on the right, you can see two and a half months later, it's almost completely, completely filled in. Now, these cases, you still have to give them time for rehab. You have to strengthen them. This horse was not healed at two and a half months, but the quality of the image at two and a half months was, was much more than what we were, were expecting. This is a suspensory branch. This is actually a jumping pony. Again, on the left, you can see that black hole there on the outside of the, the suspensory branch. You can see the thickening over it. We talked about the periligamentous fibrosis a minute ago. That's that thickened tissue over the top of it. You can look on the right again at two and a half months. You can see that lesion's already completely filled in. That fibrosis is almost completely gone. Uh, this pony went on to do really well. Um, again, one of those cases that was just almost too good to, too good to be true. This is a oblique sesamoidian ligament. This was actually in a, a barrel racing horse, uh, a five-year-old horse. Again, injected Regenoflex into that lesion. And like I said, on all these cases, these horses were shockwaved as well. So they weren't just getting the Regenoflex. They were also getting shockwave therapy. Um, this horse was started into Aquatrade as well at a, at a rehab center. Uh, this horse was back on barrels at six months. So um, that filled in really quickly. This horse recovered really well and is, is still in work. It's been over a year. That horse is, is still competing and, and doing well. Talk a little bit about the product that the Regenoflex product. And so I started about a year and a half ago doing a doing a study where we started tracking the horses that we were injecting with Regenoflex. It's the product that I was all, have already been using with my clients. You know, I'm going to use it regardless. So we started tracking these cases. We decided to do shockwave therapy with it as well for several reasons. A, that's just in the real world, if you're probably going to be shockwaving these horses um, that are getting these injuries, or at least we are in our practice. Um, so we use the combination treatment. They were getting injected with two mils of Regenoflex RT. Um, they're also getting shockwave therapy at the first at you know the first day that we injected the horse, two weeks later, and then two weeks after that. Um, the horses we're showing here were the ones that are at least a year out because we wanted to kind of see what our long-term results were. Um, looking at those horses, uh, 60% got some heat around the around that area that we injected 40 hours post injection. I actually don't think this is a bad thing. I think you want some of that mild inflammation after you inject your product. I think that's part of the healing process. Uh, none of those horses became more lame though. 80% of the horses were sound at three months. So that's a pretty large number of being sound that quickly. 80% um, also had no pain on flexion in three months. All those horses showed a significant improvement on ultrasound at three months as well. So they 80% were sound. We had 60% that had a normal appearance um, at five months. So you can see at three months, 80% were sound, but not near that many look normal yet, which is normal. Typically those horses will start to get sound before you, you can see healing of the ligament or before the ligament's healed. 70% of our horses were in full work at one year. Two were not in full work because they had injured other areas. They put back, they'd been put back into work and then injured a different structure in the body. Um, we had no proximal suspensory ligaments in the study. We're looking at branches, bodies, um, and some uh, oblique sesamoid ligaments, which are part of the suspensory apparatus. Uh, what we found was the full work at one year were similar to the PRP and shockwave horses. Um, again, two of those horses that we had, didn't they didn't re-injure that same injury. They injured something else in the body. We're not back and forward because of another issue. And we're continuing to enroll those horses um, now. The study is, is ongoing. We certainly had much more horses than 10 in the study. That's just how many we've been able to track out over a year period. So what's next? Um, well, it's certainly there's a lot of ongoing studies about exosomes. There's quite a few studies at universities where they're looking more into what exosomes are and what they do. Um, you know, can the promise meet the hype? We're going to find out. I think there's some potential to customized exosomes. So if we know that this exosome is great for this stage of healing and this injury, then there's some potential that you can customize them to for specifically what you're treating or for, or for specifically for that horse. Um, I didn't include I, I, on some of the talks I've given with, for veterinarians. I've talked about going more in depth exactly how we think exosomes work. Um, one of the big ways is to target 
M2 macrophage polarization, which is basically just these macrophages go in to heal and clean things up. There's M1, which are inflammatory, and there's M2, which are more the anti-inflammatory healing part. Um, the exosomes help keep those M2s there to maximize the healing process is basically the gist of, of that. Um, and so we're going to keep doing this study as well. Um, you know, hopefully we continue getting similar, really great results. Um, I'm really excited about what the future holds for this, for these products, for Regenoflex and also for just exosomes, exosomes in general. So uh, that's the end of the talk. Uh, I think we've got some questions here that we can answer. Uh, we'll look over here on the left. Can y'all, do y'all want to ask the question so everybody hears them or, or, or just want me to read the questions out loud and then answer them? Okay, I can just read them here. All right, there's a question about rehabbing horses. So how many times should you rehab a horse in the traditional rest kind of way from a suspensory only to have it recur? Is there a law of diminishing returns? I'm hoping that down the road, or maybe even now, there'll be some regenerative autologous transplant or similar technology that can help. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a, a magic number as to how many times I would keep re doing you know, the same injury. Now for me, typically if we've injured it twice or we've brought that horse back twice and they injured a third time, that's, I would say that's typically when I start finding a different job for that horse. Now I do have some horses that, you know, maybe we're competing at an elite level and we can change what they're doing where it's not so strenuous, you know, depending on what, what leg there is. I mean, I've had horses that we took from jumping or dressage. Um, if they're having a front limb suspensory problem, you know, Sometimes you can just find a different job for those horses, but most of the time for me, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try, a try twice. Once they injure it a third time for me, I'm typically recommending the client to, to find a different job for the horse and retire the horse. So I have another question. Um, how does this product compare to other options like Arfamid or Noltrex? Um, so they're quite different. So the product that we're talking about is, is it, you know, comes from the animal and not that animal, but from the donor. So we have donor mares that are, you know, having the amnion and all these products harvested when they're folded. And so they're just a concentration of growth factors and anti-inflammatories and exosomes that are designed to heal. Arfabed and Noltrex are polyacrylamide gels. So they're, they're a synthetic product. Um, so they're not natural. They don't come from the horse. It's actually a type of like plastic polymer. And so they're more of a mechanical aid. Now there's a little bit more to, to the, to them than just that. Like Arfamid does have some, it can integrate into a joint. It can decrease some of the inflammation in the joint secondarily, but the bit, the gist of it is we're talking about regenerative therapies that are products that have growth factors and affect the healing process in gene expression. So the, the way that um, healing process works is certain genes get triggered on and off through this process. Now, our regenerative therapies can help with that process. You get less of that with Arfamid. They're more for mechanical aids for a joint and they're joint specific or a tendon sheath, but synovial structure specific, not typically to heal an injury as opposed to our regenerative therapies, which can be used in joints, but also are used to, to heal injuries. Uh, what are some good general practices for rehabbing horses? Well, I think it just depends on if you're doing it at home or you're sending the horse to a, to a rehab facility. I think regardless, it's good to help help maintain maintain core stability when you're rehabbing a horse, whether you're doing it at home or somewhere else. So there's lots of good core exercises that that are out there. They include stretches, uh, butt tucks, lifts. So I think those are in general, no matter what you're rehabbing, I think those are are good things to maintain on those horses throughout the process. Move, you know, we used to want to just strictly stall rest stuff, um, which wasn't good for the horses. So I think so having some kind of a, a functional movement, you know, almost the whole time. Now, or, originally, if you have instability, you have a really bad tear, the horse is really lame. Obviously, those horses probably should be stall rested. But I like to get those horses moving as soon as possible. Now, moving may just mean hand walking. It may mean passive range of motion where you're taking a joint and just flexing and extending it, um, things like that. Um, but movement's important. So I want to get these horses moving as soon as we can. Um, 
And into that, you know, I think chewing can be important. You know, if we need to address um, a negative palmar angle and imbalance, I think that's important for rehab as well. You know, I love the Aquatred, you know, in, in most cases. So we have a therapy, a therapy center that we take courses to that's nearby um, that I think that could be super beneficial as well. The rehab is so specific to an injury. It's hard to be too specific other than just kind of those general, general categories. All right, that was all the questions that I saw posted here. Is there anything else that's come in? Is there a benefit to treat this product post fasciotomy? I, I would say yes, we actually do that. Um, we, I've used this product and, and PRP both post fasciotomy. Um, and typically if we're doing a fasciotomy, we're usually doing a neurectomy as well. So there's a nerve that goes, the lateral plantar nerve that goes to the, to the suspensory. So typically we're doing a fasciotomy and a neurectomy. And typically what we do is when those horses come back at two weeks to take the staples out, we go in and we inject Regenaflex or PRP into that area just to help help heal that, that ligament. Because even though they can't sometimes feel it if you have an erectomy, I think it's beneficial to help heal that as much as you can. So the, the answer is yes, I think it's beneficial to go in with regenerative therapy after a fasciotomy. Have you heard about any endurance horses that have successfully used this product? Uh, yes, I, where I'm at in Texas, we don't probably have any endurance horses. It's just not a, a big thing in our area. We have a lot of jumpers, we have a lot of dressage horses and barrel racers here. Um, I do have a colleague in the, in the Northwest that uses this product quite a bit and does a lot of endurance work. Another colleague in Virginia that uses the product and has had success with it. Um, so I've, I've heard about my colleagues that do a lot of endurance horses that use it and use it successfully. I personally, we just don't have a lot of endurance horses here. So, Average time response to being back in work using your Genoflex. Um, that, that's going to be depending on the, the injury, where their injury and where their injury is. Um, you know, in that study we, I showed earlier, you know, we had about 70% of those horses, um, 67% of those horses that were back in work at a year. And so in, in the study that we did, we we're using, I didn't want the really mild injuries because those, most of those are going to get better anyway. Um, so we used, we try to have horses in our study that were more severe. Um, so we could really test the product and really see what it could do. Um, it's hard to answer that without knowing how severe your injury is. Most dispensaries you're going to look at somewhere between the six and 12 month time frame, just depending on, how severe it is. Now, you certainly you can get ones less than six months if they're really mild um, or, or if they're in certain areas of the body. But sometimes like proximal suspensory injuries in the front leg can heal pretty quickly, sometimes three to four months, um, just depending on how severe it is. Um, so I, I can't really give anything specific without knowing more like how, where the, where the suspensory injury is and how severe it is. meant to be so the question is is this meant to be used in conjunction with shockwave therapy not necessarily it can be a standalone treatment i just think having adjunct therapies therapies that you're doing uh, multimodal treatment is is more beneficial than just a single treatment because then you're addressing the healing process from multiple different ways so it's not necessarily meant to be used with it but i think it works great with it so typically what i'll do is i'll shockwave if i'm going to inject and shockwave in the same day which i do quite often I'll, in, I'll shockwave it first because I think it helps just kind of prime those tissues. Then I'll go in afterwards and inject inject Regenaflex in there. If I'm using, if I'm using PRP, I'd be the opposite just because there was a study that shows it's beneficial to shockwave after the PRP is in there. Um, but yes, I, I think they work great together. Um, not necessarily meant to be used together, but certainly work, work great together. I, I think they complement each other. What's this cost for a usual case? Um, it's probably going to depend on, you know, kind of how much your veterinarian may charge for in injections and fees. You know, I, I think typically when we inject a product, it ends up being about $800 or so around that price. So you're probably looking at somewhere in the, depending on what the, your veterinarian charges for different things, somewhere between anywhere, probably between $600 and $1,000, kind of just depending on the, on the fees that are involved. Uh, this, thank you so much. Looking forward to including this in our toolbox for our dressage horses. 
How do we find local veterinarians that are trained still to Regenoflex? I would refer you to Amanda Drobness for that um, and, and Mark Williams as well. They could they could tell you, I'm sure, um, point you in direction of someone in your area that uses this, this product. We have a find your vet uh, spot on the website that you can absolutely look and find a vet that's closest to you. If there isn't a vet local to you, we will um, certainly introduce you to somebody that um, that we that we can make connections for. So thank you for yeah, that. I've talked to a lot of veterinarians around the country too that are, aren't familiar with the product and have questions because I've used a lot of it. So um, if you have a veterinarian, you know, and they want some information about it, want to know my experience, I'm happy to happy to discuss that you know with other veterinarians. So. There any more have more questions? I haven't seen any more come up on the screen yet. No. Well, if not, I thank everybody for joining us tonight and hope you learned something. Um, you know, if, again, I'd be happy to talk to talk to your veterinarians if they have any questions that I can answer. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Whitaker. Thank you all for your participation and great questions. Um, we look forward to to talking to some of you in the future. So thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I'm Will Coleman. My name's Liz Halliday. My name's Megan Kefferly. <laughs>